Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the hearing committee. We appreciate your careful attention to the evidence considered over the last four days. We know it's been a, a long four days, and uh, what we'll do in closing is try to hit the highlights in, t in context of the arguments uh, with respect to the violations that are at issue here. <clears throat> Mr. Nifong, as the district attorney in Durham County, has the responsibility of a minister of justice and not simply an advocate. As the DA, as with any prosecutor, his most important duty and responsibility is to seek justice, not merely to convict. This responsibility, which is the most fundamental to our entire system of justice, mandates that the defendant be accord accorded procedural justice and that guilt be decided on the basis of sufficient evidence, presented in a court of law, not in the media. This responsibility to justice in North Carolina requires the prompt disclosure of all relevant information to the defendant, particularly any exculpatory or impeachment information. For the criminal justice system to work in North Carolina, this responsibility to justice demands that a prosecutor be absolutely honest and accurate in all representations made to the court, defense counsel, and others. As a member of a self-regulating legal profession, Mr. Nifong has the obligation to make honest, full, fair, and most importantly, true responses to the State Bar and this Commission. The clear, cogent, and convincing evidence presented over the last four days demonstrates that Mr. Nifong engaged in a systematic abuse of prosecutorial power and discretion in the Duke Lacrosse cases. That systematic pattern of abuse began from his very first involvement in the cases and continued up through this hearing. Through this systematic abuse of trust, power, and discretion provided to district attorneys in North Carolina, Mr. Nifong did not act as a minister of justice, but a minister of injustice. He was a minister of injustice first and foremost to the three innocent lacrosse players that he prosecuted and their families but also to the other players and their families, to the actual victims of sexual assault, to the reputation and integrity of prosecutors and lawyers throughout the state, and finally, to the entire system of justice in North Carolina. In these cases, Mr. Nifong engaged in this systematic pattern of prosecutorial power and discretion in two principal and overriding ways. First, on the very first involvement, Mr. Nifong began his charge forward toward condemnation and injustice. Again, from his very first involvement in this case, Mr. Nifong began to weave a web of deception, which has continued up through this hearing. <clears throat> We have alleged violations of Rule 3.6 regarding pretrial publicity and Rule 3.8F concerning the special responsibilities of the prosecutor. Although even in his testimony yesterday, Mr. Nifong has never definitively and conclusively admitted any violations of these rules. Whether he committed such violations is not really genuinely in dispute. The State Bar clearly has met its burden concerning violations of these rules. The violations do not require intentional conduct with respect to extrajudicial statements. The issue with respect to those extrajudicial statements are the severity of the violations and whether Mr. Nifong made them knowingly and intentionally and his intentions and motives for doing so. The State Bar does not have the, any burden to prove either of those issues. However, they are important in evaluating this entire case and considering his intentions and credibility on the remaining violations. The State Bar has also alleged that some of his statements were not only improper under the rules, but also false or misleading. These statements can be considered as separate rule violations or as an aggravation and evidence of his intentional misconduct. <clears throat> as you know, 3.6a prohibits extrajudicial statements that lawyer reasonably know 
will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicated proceeding. It's important to keep in mind in evaluating these issues that the prohibitions contained in this rule are designed to preserve and protect the Sixth Amendment constitutional right to a fair trial by an impartial jury, as noted in Comment 1 to that rule. Exactly 100 years ago, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, addressing the right to a fair trial, wrote, the theory of our system is that the conclusions to be reached in a case will be induced only by evidence and argument in open court, and not by any outside influence, whether of private talk or public print.